Hey friends, Bethel here. Today I want to talk to you about Yom Kippur. So as you may know, I've been doing um, a series of videos on the fall festivals in the Bible. And I've already done one on Rosh Hashanah, so if you haven't seen that video, you might want to check it out first. Um, as I was describing in that video, there are seven mandated feasts in the Bible. The first four have already been fulfilled by Jesus. And these last three remain, which are Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. Psalm 79.9 says, Help us, O God, for our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sins, for your name's sake. So as we learned in the last video, Rosh Hashanah is all about repentance and reflection and just taking that time to get closer to the Lord. Um, and Yom Kippur is all about atonement. Um, and we're going to go in deeper to atonement, but briefly, basically Yom Kippur literally, literally means to atone. But atonement actually means the act of correcting a wrong, making amends, and reconciling with God. In more simple terms though, atonement is like saying you're sorry, correcting that wrong, and asking for forgiveness. So it is kind of a step further in. The night before, um, Yom Kippur, which is actually called uh, Erev Yom Kippur. Erev means evening in Hebrew. And on this night, there is a celebration meal. So typically it includes like chicken, um, soups possibly, rice. So they have a couple of like staple type items, but sometimes it also includes challah bread, which is one of my absolute favorite breads I've discovered <laughs> and I have a free recipe on my website if you'd like one but they also have a ton of options on Pinterest which is um, where I started when I was looking. Yom Kippur is also known as the Sabbath of Sabbaths or Shabbat Shabbaton and it is considered the most holy day because it is a day of solemn rest and solemn means formal, dignified, or deep sincerity. Leviticus 16, 29 through 32 says, And it shall be a statute to you forever, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves, and you shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever, and the priest who is anointed and consecrated as the priest in his father's place shall make atonement wearing the holy linen garment. After that celebration meal, there begins a fast. Now I wanna pause here for a minute and talk about fasting because types of fasts can vary. Um, typically fasts are when you eat little to no food and sometimes it's with or without water. So this process of fasting is intended to bring us closer to the Lord and to remind us of how much He actually does provide for us on a daily basis. On Yom Kippur, there are some fasting rules typically. So it's a little bit different. No eating or drinking, no washing or bathing, no makeup, lotion or perfumes, and no leather shoes. So they really do take this fast pretty serious and because it is the holiest day, they spend that time um, being a little more diligent with their fasting. And you may be asking, why not leather shoes? And from the research I've done, um, what I've discovered is it's because it is considered a luxury item and the intent is to be very humble and not be dressing up or being fancy that day. If, you, if we remember, Jesus even fasted before he started his ministry, and that was after he was baptized in the Jordan. Mark 1, 12 through 13 says, the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. In order to really understand Yom Kippur, it's really important to understand atonement. So let's go back to Genesis, back to the beginning, to, to really try to understand. I'm going to try to explain it the best I can, um, because once I finally understood this part, it was just such a game changer for me. In Genesis 3, as you know, Adam and Eve screwed up. 
because God told them not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then Satan came and tried to convince Eve that what God said wasn't true. So then she ate and then Adam ate too. And because of that, they risked death. So God made a way for them to draw near to him because, of, because what they did caused separation from God because they didn't obey and they had went against what God said and risked death. Because of that, the animals which the Lord had made took the place of Adam and Eve's death. Now, I just want to pause for a minute because I don't think we ever really consider how precious our animals are. You know, there's a saying that says something like, and I don't know who said it, but it's something like, blessed are those who have no words for they speak no evil. And it was referring to animals. And the Lord made the animals and then because of what we did, the innocent animal took our place of our sin. Atonement and purification go hand in hand. It was customary back during the Old Testament that the high priest would do, go through like a ritual cleansing before he could go into the Holy of Holies, which was done during Yom Kippur. This ritual cleansing was called um, mikvah, is like a spiritual bath that you would go and do this cleansing and then you would put on white garments. This tradition has carried on to today and many men and women also go through this mikvah and wear white garments on Yom Kippur. The white garment is called a kittle and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that exactly right, but the kittle was actually worn by a groom often during marriage and it could be worn at burial as well, which I found very interesting. <laughs> Leviticus 16.30 says, For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all of your sins. Another very interesting part of Yom Kippur is that the high priest was only allowed to go into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle one time a year. And Yom Kippur was the time. Another reason it's the holiest day. On this day there was a special ceremony where there was an offering of a bull which was for the priest and his household and then there were two goats that were offered for Israel. Leviticus 16 6 through 7 said Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent meeting. So out of these two goats, one was selected for the sacrifice and the other was considered the scapegoat. The priest would lay his hands on the scapegoat and confess all the sins of the people on it. And I think that's really interesting because it sounds very familiar of what we're used to with what Jesus did for us. This is actually where the term scapegoat came from and Jesus is our scapegoat. And then the second thing I want to talk about is the veil, which for me after learning this is just so, it's so beautiful. Um, the high priest, when he goes into the tabernacle, uh, there is this large veil separating the holy place from the holy of holies. And it separates people from that special section, the holiest place, because you risked death if the glory of the Lord came in there and there was nothing shielding that. So that was like for our protection. It, it's a, it was a protective veil that um, sealed off that area of the room. Exodus 26, 31 through 33 says, and you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. And you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. When Jesus came, he told his disciples that he was the way, the truth, and the life. 
and that no one could come to the Father except through him. Jesus took the place of the yearly sacrifice and, in a sense, he represented the veil between the people and God. Jesus is forgiving and intercedes for us. This is one of the reasons I think it is so important to read and understand the Old Testament because it helps us so much with the New Testament and the deeper meanings and understandings that come with that as well. Before I understood these festivals in the Old Testament, I had no idea the magnitude of the veil. In Mark 15, 37 through 38, it says, And Jesus uttered a, a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Jesus' death on the cross tore the curtain from top to bottom in the temple. This veil was finely woven and it was a fabric wall. It wasn't just a, a typical curtain that we're used to. It was four inches thick. So that's like <laughs> the size of your palm, you know? Uh, it was that thick and intricately woven together. For it to tear from top to bottom would have been amazing. It's, it, it would not have happened, you know, unless it was supernatural. Jesus is like a bridge, a go-between, the one who stands in the midst between us and the Father, the one who can reach through the heavenly veil to forgive, strengthen, protect, and save us. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation means the act of gaining or regaining the favor or goodwill of someone or something. Hebrews 10, 19-22 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. After knowing more about the Most Holy Day, can you see how some people might believe that this would be the season for the Lord's return? In the next video, we're going to talk about Sukkot, which is a really cool festival as well. And in that video, I'm going to do my best to try to tie everything together. And I hope that this video blessed you today. I hope that you have some challah bread this season or make some. It's so good. And I can't wait to see you guys next time.